undertaken here is a whole new theory of quantum. And, and you know, politically, uh, scientifically, um, I don't know where I want to put this, within the context of uh, what the physics re community requires of, of physicists, this is uh, not what you want to be doing. Maybe you want to do it quietly in your own room, but actually publicize the fact that you're endeavoring to suggest that one of the central theorems of quantum mechanics might not be perfect. Um, it's not something you want to undertake lightly. So we have to understand, or I have to explain first why this, it's important to embark on this voyage. And then to explain, and to do that I have to explain what's wrong with the current set of theories called quantum mechanics. And I also have to explain what's superior about and different about the, the new theory of Randy Mills. Okay, I think I'm going to start by very briefly reminding everybody what the theory of Randy Mills is, the classical quantum mechanics. Essentially, he says, the atom, all atoms, consist of a nucleus, and we don't have to concern ourselves with the nature of it. It's got plus charges, but it's central. And around it, electrons. But these electrons aren't little planetary bodies. The solar system is not a proper physical model of this version of the structure of an atom. In the classical quantum mechanics model of the atom, the proper model is a series of bubbles, like almost soap bubble-like objects that surround the nucleus and have physical motion within them. And we don't even get into the details of that motion. But basically the model says that um, you can apply Maxwell's equations and Newton's laws, nothing else, nothing new, uh, to predict um, at what radii these bubbles will be stable. And all you have to do is set up a force balance based on um, Coulombic attraction for a one electron system, for example. And say, okay, you also require that the electron have the h-bar uh, over 2 of angular momentum. Using those two requirements, you actually find that you have a particular solution. It says this is the so-called ground state of the electron. And if you apply this very simple force balance, no new physics here at all, just a new geometry, you'll, you'll get uh, the ground state of all one electron atoms that are measured. Starting with hydrogen, helium plus, etc. Okay, so that's, that's the new theory. The new theory really isn't new. I mean, that's the misconception. On the other hand is what's now the current paradigm of quantum mechanics, which is the uh, what we all call standard quantum mechanics. And what we're going to learn, first of all, is there really is no standard quantum mechanics. That's one of the big surprises. There's at least three families of theories of quantum mechanics, and they're all contradictory to each other. And once we see that there's actually three families and why there are three families of, of theory, because <clears throat> to find agreement with experimental data, we need each of these theories. But we, we don't have the luxury of jumping back and forth between them according to um, what piece of experimental evidence we want to agree with. That's it. According to Karl Popper, that's an inconsistent theory, therefore it's not a theory at all. So, all right, before I get back to more detailed descriptions of classical quantum mechanics, I want to talk briefly about the three families of standard quantum theory that exist today. The last comment I'll make as an introduction to this discussion of standard quantum mechanics as it currently exists and the fact that there's three families of theories is to talk about each of these theories in relationship to the, to the uh, Pauli exclusion principle. For example, the descriptive quantum mechanics, it's, it's a standard, uh, fundamental um, tenet of the theory that both electrons and helium have the same energy. They're both S electrons, they're in the ground state, they must have the same energy. Okay, if we talk about um, the third family, the hartree fock family, the kind of mixture of descriptive quantum and, and 
and quantitative quantum mechanics, um, that hybrid theory. Whenever they do the calculations for a two electron atom, whether it be helium, lithium, missing an electron, whatever, they always are going to insist that both electrons have the same energy. That's going to be a starting point. They're going to make their calculations work so that both electrons and helium are at 24.7. And we've already described how that doesn't make any sense. Because if they're both at 24.7, when you start and one gets ionized and the other one falls to 54.4, that actually means that the helium ion is it's more stable than the helium atom because you actually get five electron volts plus from that reaction. Write it down yourself and you'll see that. And as I described before, if you start with that ionized electron at minus 54.4, there's no energy in the process that we observe to bring it back up to 24.6 electron volts. What's really interesting is when we look at the uh, Pauli exclusion principle in relation to the real deal, standard quantitative quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation version, it actually makes no sense to talk about the Pauli exclusion principle. It's complete gibberish. It's like talking about the fundamental color of a triangle or um, the temperature of black or something like that. It's just you're, you're mixing and matching things that don't mix and match. Because as I explained, for example, a 10 electron system, all the electrons are indistinguishable. The Pauli exclusion principle tells you, no, if I have a 10 electron system, I have two S electrons, six P electrons, and a couple of D electrons. Well, which two of the indistinguishable electrons are in the S state? Which six are in the P state? And which two are in the D state? And there's only one wave function. There are no S orbitals and P orbitals and D orbitals. There is only an orbital, and they're all in it. So this hydrogen model, which is the basis of the Pauli exclusion principle, doesn't make any sense. It's, it's gibberish in this model of quantum mechanics. You can't talk about these the two electrons and helium are in one state, uh, and et cetera, because the language doesn't fit. There's only one orbital. All the electrons are in it. They're all indistinguishable. You can't say two are in this one. And, um, we have six others that are indistinguishable in the next hydrogen-like state, etc. So it's just interesting to reflect on that before we go into more detail on each of these families of theory. This individual, that's myself, I don't believe in any of these theories because I don't believe that you can have families of theories and jump between them to pick the one that works for the particular problem you're trying to solve because that's inconsistency. And I don't like inconsistent theories. And these, these theories are inconsistent with each other. So I'm saying, and not only that, I've also described how we're going to show that none of them, they all require the Pauli exclusion principle to be true, and energy conservation requires that the Pauli exclusion principle not be true. And eventually I'm going to suggest that this new theory that was developed by Randy Mills, and I've kind of followed it in a slightly different, led to different conclusions than what Randy would, would suggest it leads to, but I, I believe I followed the theory without deviation and just allowed it to lead where it wants to, that this theory actually shows that in the helium atom, in the ground state, what we call the ground state, one electron is at minus 54.4 electron volts and one is at minus 24.6 at time zero. That is the ground state configuration of helium. Two electrons at different energies and different size bubbles of charge. They don't overlap, they are not the same. And what we're going to find is remarkably there's not a shred of data inconsistent with what the classical quantum mechanics predicts. That is that there are two electrons in the ground state of helium which are not at the same energy. And this model is consistent with energy conservation. It's remarkable. Nothing about the universe. The well, I think I'm below practically nothing. <laughs> Less than nothing. <laughs> exactly. You see, I think that physicists have this, have this arrogance to think that they do know something. Well, they don't know anything. 
and the stuff they know they don't know because it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's based on assumptions, uh, false premises. Yeah, but you can check their premises against data. Yeah, and then find it doesn't and, and work. And it doesn't work, but you can show it in their faces, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, you just don't understand something. Well, what is it I don't understand? <laughs> well, I'm not the guy smart enough to tell you, but there must be somebody out there.